Thank you, Brother Stoffman. Let us remain standing just a moment while we pray. Blessed Father, we pray that you'll get glory out of our being here tonight. May we leave with a heart full of love and adoration to thee. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Each evening, I find some handkerchiefs here to be prayed over, which I do in the closing prayer. I remember them and pray for them. Now, we've had many things that our Lord has done for us in praying for the sick by the handkerchiefs. And we're only happy to do it. And if I happen to miss you, just write me a letter to Jeffersonville, Indiana, and request a prayer cloth, and it'll be sent to you free. And we keep them many times. Many people keep them right in their Bible on that scripture of, of the 19th chapter of Acts. Just in the case of something happens, they use them. And it is surprising at the testimonies that we get of what's happened with those handkerchiefs. It's just little tokens, but yet it's scriptural. I remember in South Africa, someone said, Brother Branham is superstitious. I believe they had eight or nine big grass sacks, we call them uh, burlap sacks full of handkerchiefs for one night. It's all sitting on the platform, just sacks full of these handkerchiefs to pray over them. And the man, of course, did not know the scriptures, said that I was superstitious by praying over these handkerchiefs. But it isn't a superstition. It's the scripture. Um, last, this morning rather, we had one of the nicest times of fellowship with the ministers here of this city and the visiting ministers that came to the breakfast. One of the nicest little fellowships I believe I ever sat in with. Oh, everybody with one accord. And there were different denominations, the Baptists and different ones that shook my hands as they left the door. And that's what I call sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And if the Holy Spirit could meet with us in a hotel room this morning in that manner with that many Christians... What should it do tonight with this great host of Christians here? It could just do anything. And I'm expecting him to do great things. Now, I have taken much time this week and trying to, to break something down. And that is a feeling that... Usually, I have, this is a wonderful place, this exhibition grounds. We do most graciously appreciate them. But in the midst of that, a place like this is usually used for amusements. Races and rodeos. And, and that, you may call me really superstitious after this. But that type of spirit hangs around those places. That's exactly right. You'll never have a better meeting anywhere than you will in a church. A real spirit-filled church. And it's so hard to get that away. To preach against it and to lay it back. Now, nothing with the peoples. That we're grateful for these places. And we certainly appreciate them. And this fine man that's doing the operating of this instrument here, I believe... Uh, operated it for me the last time I was here, around ten years ago. I got to meet him out there. A wonderful person. Everybody's been very nice, and we appreciate it. But yet, in these grounds here, you have gambling, you have just everything, and that's the way you find it. If you go into a place of amusement, you find that type of spirit there. You go into a place of gambling, you find that type of spirit and when we go into a place of worship, we want to worship and have a spirit of worship. And that's what I want you to do is with prayer to help me to press away 
from all the indifference because it'll, it'll show a greater effect among the sick people. I've tried hard to wait and for that to move on until we get to bringing those sick people across this platform in great massive numbers. Now, Billy said tonight that he'd give out some more prayer cards this afternoon, but said the reason he couldn't give out prayer cards all the time, they're to be given out at six o'clock. Said that maybe there's four or five people here. Just a little group, and some of them's already holding prayer cards. So that's the reason we give out as many as we can at this time. Now, tomorrow night, the Lord willing, we're going to take those prayer cards and bring them across this platform praying for them. Now, that seemingly is the, the approach that the people want. Why you want to be Jews, I don't know. But that's the Jewish custom. Gentiles never acted like that in the Bible. The Jews said, come lay your hand on my daughter and she'll get well, laying on of hands. The Gentiles said, I'm not even worthy that you come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will live. And Jesus turned around and said, I've never seen faith like that in you Israelites that want hands laid on you. See? And that's my ministry has never been too forceful amongst English-speaking people, Americans and Canadians and so forth. I don't know why. They just seem like it doesn't take with them. But when I go into the other fields, in Africa, where we had seen uh, just five people cross the platform with them discernments to the Mohammeds, there were 10,000 Mohammeds come to Christ at one time. 30,000 altogether of people who denied Jesus Christ as being Savior. Just from them, one little miracle taking place. And then I asked a massive prayer over nearly 200,000 people. Just a massive prayer. And Dr. F.F. F. Bosworth, how many remembers Mr. Bosworth? You Canadians, why well, he's been through your countries here. Well, he's coming to the end of the road now. He's going towards 90. He can't go out no more. I'm going to see him after this meeting. And he's getting old. And he's such a lovely old man. I hope that I can come to the end of my road like F.F. F. Bosworth. Not one mark against him anywhere. Lovely, godly, saintly man. And he stood there, and I know there's what they call the evangelistic count. But far be it from Mr. Bosworth ever overestimating anything. And he estimated of 25,000 healings at one little prayer after a person was healed at the platform. They'd taken seven big truck loads, that's big cattle trucks, loads of crutches, wheelchairs, stretchers, clubs, and things that the people had walked on, seven big loads of them off of the grounds after that one prayer. Seven loads of them. But we English-speaking people, oh, we went through all the school and we've had too much school. And then it's pitiful. One fellow will say, this is right and that's wrong and this is right and that's wrong. The poor people don't know where they're standing. It's just hard. And then another thing, we've seen so many, you know, there is believers and unbelievers and make-believers. And we see a lot of make-believers. And there they see a total failure. And therefore, it, it quenches their faith. And then when they see God do something, they just think, well, it just so happened that way. But it happens that way every time to a believer. See? God cannot be a respected person. My heart was so happy about one hour ago, watching from my room where I was praying, getting ready for the meeting tonight. My little girl come running. They don't call me when I'm in the room praying or making ready for a service. And she, so enthused, she knocked at the door. She said, Daddy, there goes that little boy down the street with a yo-yo in his hand, was on the platform last night blind. And I looked out the window, and as far as I could make out, it was a father with a white dress coat on, nice-looking man, and he had a, the little boy going down the street playing with a yo-yo coming to church. I wonder if that was the little boy 
If it is with the father raised up his hand somewhere, was going down, I don't know what street it is, it's somewhere out this way. Yet here they are up here in the balcony tonight, going down the street, playing with the yo-yo. So happy. I know you are too, aren't you, brother? Yes, sir. Does this sight seem to be getting better? Can you notice much difference in it? Sir? He believes his sight is getting better. That's wonderful, isn't it? And he was stabbed out with a buoy knife or some kind of a little jackknife, I believe they call it. What has to happen? There has to be a creation there. Tomorrow night, God willing, for that service that's coming up, I'm going to preach on Abraham and faith tomorrow night, the Lord willing. Now tonight, so we can get right into the service, and now everybody that's holding prayer cards, be sure to be in tomorrow night. For that's what we're giving the night for after the preaching service is to pray, lay hands on every person that's holding a prayer card tomorrow night, if we possibly can get to them all. And then I hope that you're built up in the most holy faith that so that when you come here to be prayed for, you'll not be coming to be touched by some certain man or something. That has nothing to do with it. It's your faith in Christ. You don't have to even come here. You stay right where you are and you can be healed. Now that's the way and I've, most of my work has been overseas. And it just seems like if, the, if those hottentots and people there can grasp that, why can't we smart, educated people do it? When we ought to know more about the Bible than those people do. And it's because we've heard it just in one line. That's what the Pharisees turned Jesus down by. They just heard it in their own way. But they hadn't heard the truth of it. Jesus Christ has purchased every salvation and every healing when he died at Calvary. And don't never let any man ever tell you that there's anything about him that can heal you. For he's absolutely wrong, either mentally or scripturally. He is scripturally wrong. And he might be nervous and upset. He might have seen, I don't say if he said he's seen an angel, and the angel told him that he had power to heal the people, the angel told him something that the Bible denies. See? For his, by his stripes you were healed. Christ healed you, and there's nothing no one else can do about it. It's your individual faith in his vicarious suffering for you at Calvary. That's as plain as I know the gospel. No man can forgive your sins. I don't care whether he's a priest, cardinal, bishop, pope, whatever he is. No man can forgive sins. The sins that you have committed, they are already forgiven. You just have to accept your pardon that Christ paid for you at Calvary. How many believes that's the gospel? That's this, it, brother. So there's no power in my hands. There's no power in any other man's hands to heal anybody. The power is in your faith in Jesus Christ. There's the power. Now let us approach the scriptures and speak just for a short time. I'll watch and then if we get through in time, we'll call a few people here at the platform somewhere out of those prayer cards out there and pray a little and try tonight if we can get that faith to a place to where everybody can be healed. Everybody at one time. I've seen it so many times I know it can happen here, and that's what I've longed to see. May God grant it is my prayer. See a little polio boy sitting here in front tonight. Perhaps his mommy with him. Two little boys with braces on. You know, if there was one power in me that would heal that little boy sitting there, just a little bigger than my little Joseph. <laughs> I walk right down there now. That's right. But there, I couldn't do it. I can't do it. But if the little fellow, if there's something in the family that the family's done that's caused this, maybe it was for the glory of God. Maybe it's something that they've done. Maybe it's a sin of someone else. Their grandparents. He said he'd visited iniquity of the children to the third and fourth generation. I don't know. But whatever that is, God can reveal that to me. That's true. But to heal him, I couldn't do it. Here sits one of his good of friends that I ever had in my life, Brother Dawson. A minister, a gospel minister, a man that I truly love. And each night I've stood here, just watch over him every few minutes. I'll keep turning and looking at Brother Dawson, see if it's there. I want to see it so bad. 
I don't know why God put him in a wheelchair. I don't question that. Surely it's for the good, Brother Dawson was an honest man. It may be for the glory of God. I hope it's to open the eyes of Edmonton. I do. I don't know. I'm praying that God will somehow show us and tell us and help us. And if you'll just all forsake your thoughts for a little bit and just get in one accord. Oh, if you'll just let every heart beat the same towards Christ tonight, you'll see the exceedingly abundantly. I remember that. Feast on the Word. Believe with all your heart. Enter into it. Amen. Get into the service. Get into the worship. And don't be ashamed. Just in your heart. I don't mean you have to scream. If you feel like screaming, that's up to you. But if you'll just... That doesn't profit too much. But if you'll just get into the worship of it. Amen. Oh, Jesus, how lovely you really are. I never knew you so sweet. That's when you get into it. That's when God comes down and pours His blessings right over everywhere. That's when something happens. In the scriptures tonight for the reading, I wish to take a text out of Revelations, the sixth chapter. I want to read a portion of the sixth chapter. And I saw when the Lamb had opened one of the seals... I heard as it was a noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And my subject tonight is the mighty conqueror. Some time ago, I was standing where the great Constantine stood when he was going over into Rome to liberate the church. The church had been under cruel persecutions for many years. And while Constantine on his road over there, one night he was wakened out of his sleep by a dream. And in this dream, something spoke to him and told him to paint a white cross on his shields of his man, and by this they would conquer and he arose at midnight and got all of his men up and painted white sh crosses on their shields. And by that, they were to become conquerors. And if you are ever going to be a conqueror, you're going to have to come by the cross. We are told that the church was progressing all the time under persecution. I crossed the river and went into Rome. I went down to the San Angelo catacomb. And while going through the catacombs and seeing the, the tombs where the bodies had been buried of the peoples that had died under persecution... And at the corners was little shark graves. That were the babies. And then I went over into the Colosseum. There I stood there where the doctors used to make the decision on whether the man was to die or not after they made them fight till death. And when they had decided that the man should die, the gladiators would hang their thumbs out over the walls and would push their thumbs down. That meant that the man must die. One had fought the other until Christian fighting Christian, until they would one would be down and they'd ask for whether his life should be spared or not. They'd thumbs down and they would kill the Christian. As I stood there, my heart was moved. 
And I raised my hands up to God. I said, God, be merciful. The gladiator said, thumbs down. But I'm saying, hands up. Raise them up, O oh God, in triumph at that last day, for you promised you would do it. That precious faith of the early church that was pure gold, said the Bible, tried in fire. And how they would open the pits of that great arena, setting like that only in the bleachers as we call it and the great massive place down here and they would burn them to the state they would open the doors and traps of hungry lions and tigers and they would rush forth on a praying bunch of Christians and just drag them from bone to bone and the faith of those people that stood firm. And in the midst of all that, the church growed mightily all the time. And after Constantine come over and liberated them from under the Roman persecution and united the church and state together, that's where we got Catholic to begin with, and when they did, the church lost more grounds in ten years than it had gained all through the persecution. If there's anything that makes Christians lazy, it's when they're on a flower bed of ease. We don't have it persecution enough. We don't have it hard enough. Always at the chain is the strongest at its weakest link. And a man under pressure is what he is when he's under pressure. His real two true characteristics will show when he's under pressure. Get him all round, stir it up. Then you'll see the real man come out. If he's got temper, it'll show itself. If he's meek and gentle, it'll show itself. Put him under pressure once. God puts all his children under test to see where there's any flaws in them. You're not long ago doing the depression. It was easy to find people at a prayer meeting. But now that they can work in the defense plane and the union gives them so much money that they hardly know what to do with, you have to almost persuade them to a meeting. They got all... The people doesn't want preaching anymore. You get somebody to come up here and act the clown... And this auditorium would pack out the first night. Or somebody come up here and jingle a few things and run up and down the platform and scream a few times, turn a handspring or two. The people wants entertainment and not the gospel. Brother, when it comes to the place that I have to substitute something else for the gospel, I'll close the Bible and go home. Right. When the precious blood of Jesus Christ preached in its power don't attract the people, they're dead. But we got too many televisions and too many radio programs and entertainments. A Christian wants to be entertained by the Holy Spirit. And too much world has leaked into the church. And they have substituted entertainment instead of gospel preaching. The old-fashioned gospel that saved your father and mother, it's just as good tonight as it was in that day and always will be. It's still the same thrill to the Christian heart 
as it was to St. Paul who sealed his testimony with his blood. The gospel shall never lose its power to the believer. Oh, at ease. I was in Switzerland not long ago, a few months ago, and oh, how indifferent they were. Very much indifferent. The church rose up a persecution. And the night that Billy Grimm closed on Saturday night, I began the next morning on Sunday. And when I got the Sunday paper, it was a disgrace the way they made fun of that God-saved man. They said he'd come out and wouldn't stay in an ordinary hotel. He had to have the best. Said he put one of them uh, uh, waves in his hair with a, one of these m- m- things, you know, like the women do. And he said that he looked like he was going to a bandbox in the stead of the pulpit. Not a wrinkle in his clothes. And said he swung his hands when he was preaching like a fantastic American soap salesman. And they said also that you could smell him ten feet away for perfumes. And I know the reason they did it. Because the Swiss people does not accept the blood of the Lord Jesus. They've got the Swingley doctrine. And Swingley said that Jesus was not the Son of God. He was the Son of Joseph called the Son of God. That takes the whole foundation from under Christianity. He was either God or the greatest deceiver the world's ever had. And Billy Grimm didn't pull any punches. He preached the supreme deity of Jesus Christ. And I knowed if he did that woe unto me when I got up. But what is it? They haven't had any trouble. They're living at ease. But just as I cross the line into Germany, what a difference. They had had war and trouble. Those poor Christians had cried and begged and fasted. They were ready for the gospel. They had had some trouble. God may have to give us a little trouble after a while. Kind of bring us around to ourselves with a few atomic bombs or something. He's got a way of doing it. He certainly has, and he's no respect of nation. He didn't respect Israel, his son. When he got out of line with his word, he said, Judgment. I walked into Switzerland not long ago, or to Sweden. I'd come out of Finland. It was like daylight from dark. Finland was war-torn, and those Christians were just prayed up, spiritual. I went into Norway, the same thing. Right after the war, big bunches of little ladies downtown, their husbands all killed off. Just ladies, young women walking together, widows. But when I got into Sweden, oh, so much different. No wars for 130 years. It takes persecution. I think of the old Irish song my mother used to sing. Must I be carried home to heaven on a flower bed of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? No, I must fight if I must reign. Increase my courage, Lord. That's what we need. Conquer. A few months ago, I stood in Brussels, Belgium, and at the airport, I was given a little book. I seen it there in the rack, and I looked at that little book, and it was a short history of Napoleon, and how Napoleon hated the French, and how he went over there, oh, and become in their army, and finally become the great conqueror. 
And at the age of 33, he had conquered the entire known world as a young man. Right out from Brussels at Waterloo, they got all the old relics reproduced again to show where he come to his end. He was at the beginning of prohibitionist. He died a wall-eyed, batty-eyed, alcoholic insane. It goes to show, though he had conquered the world, he had been a failure. And how many times and too oft have we forgot the great Arnold von Winkler of Switzerland? Many years ago when some of the Germans went up into Switzerland, a little people that loved peace, and they had their little homes and things in the mountains and valleys in Switzerland. One day a great invading army come into Switzerland, all well trained, and the little Swiss army with rocks, sticks, and little old sickles and whatever they could pick up on the farm to fight with, they gathered in the valley to meet the oncoming army. And when this little handful of Swiss backed up against the mountain, watch coming out from the other side as their foes come on, it looked like a brick wall. Every man in perfect step, great armors and shields, great long spears, every man so polished and trained till it looked like a, just a brick wall. What was this little handful of man up the side of a, such an army? And they knew they were defeated. And they knew that their houses would be burnt, their wives would be ravished, their children would be taken prisoners, their, all their little economy was gone. And finally, a man that should never be forgotten, and he won't as long as there's a Switzerland, by the name of Arnold von Winkler, he stepped out in front of the little army. He said, man of Switzerland, this day I give my life for Switzerland, and this day I shall conquer. He said, over yonder's hill is a little white home, a sweet loving wife, three little children, and I told them goodbye. And I'd be back again after a while. But said, I'll never see them again on this earth. For this day I must give my life for Switzerland. They said, Arnold von Winklard, what will you do? And he turned towards the oncoming army. He looked it all over. He found where the darkest in the midst of the spears was. He had a stick in his hand. He threw it down. He said, follow me and fight with all you've got with what you have to fight with. And he threw away his stick, threw his hands in the air and screamed, make way for liberty. Make way for liberty. And as he rushed towards that great bunch of spears, a hundred shining spears reached out to pick him up. And as he plunged into him, he grabbed his arms out, a whole armful of them, and threw them into his chest and screamed, Make way for liberty! And with such a display of heroism, it routed the army. And those men behind followed with their sticks and clubs, and they beat that army out of their land and they've never had a war since. Why was it? Because one man had the zeal and 
the heroism about him to be a conqueror. That's been many hundred years ago. Up in the Swiss Alps, just speak his name today. And you'll see the tears running down their cheeks. They so appreciate that great, mighty Arnold von Winkler. That is that display of heroism has seldom been compared with and never exceeded. But oh, that was such a little thing. So one day, when Adam's race had been backed into a corner, God had sent prophets, they'd killed him, righteous man, and they'd stoned him. And the devil, oncoming army, had Adam's race backed into a corner without hope, without God, without mercy, without anything. Sickness, diseases, ignorance, they were just hopeless. There wasn't nothing could help them. But there was one stepped out in heaven and said, I must go to earth, Father, and give my life for Adam's fallen race. He came to the earth and he lived here 33 years. He looked the earth over and he found out where the man's greatest fear was. And it was death that was the center of it. And he run to Calvary, pressing the swords right into his own bosom, the swords of death. And he sent the Holy Spirit back on the day of Pentecost. And by this we are to conquer the world and follow him as a hero of his blessings. What a difference between Napoleon... What Napoleon failed to do at 33, Christ at 33 had conquered. He's a mighty conqueror. When he was 33 years old, Napoleon, he had conquered the world with guns and bullets and cannons and swords. And what a disgrace when 10,000 prostitutes followed his army. All sin and so forth. Hatred, malice, there was nothing left for him but to perish. But Jesus, at the age of 33, had conquered devils. They knew him. They said, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. Why do you come to torment us before the time? knowing that they had a future punishment. He conquered sickness at the touch of his hand. Fevers departed. When he was 33, he conquered everything. A woman come to me not long ago. She said, Mr. Branham, I do like to hear you speak. But she said, there's one thing that you do that's wrong. Well, I said, my sister... I'll be very glad to straighten up anything that's wrong. That's what I'm here for. Now, she belonged to a church that does not believe in the supreme deity of Jesus Christ. They think he's a prophet, just a man. She, I don't say this to hurt feelings. Anyone knows it. And I don't take up for anybody's religion or condemn anybody's religion. But she was a Christian science and they believed in healing and so forth. But they didn't believe that Jesus was a virgin-born Son of God. They didn't accept His blood. Mary the Baker and them did not believe in that. And if you do that, it takes all the cream. That's the, that's the very lifeline of Christianity. Wish I had time to stop and go into it. But she said, Mr. Branham, you said you was a fundamentalist. I said, as far as I know, I believe every word the Bible says. She said, if I prove to you by your Bible that he was nothing but a man and said, you make him God. I said, he was God. 
He was a God man. And she said, I can prove to you that he wasn't divine by your Bible. I said, my lady, I would like to see you do it. If the Bible said he was nothing but a man, then I will accept it that way. And she said, all right. And she referred me to St. John 11, the 11th chapter of St. John. When Jesus, she said, was going down to the grave of Lazarus, said the Bible said that he wept. And she said, Mr. Branham, how could he be divine and weep? Said he could not be divine and then weep. I said, lady, you failed to see who he was. He was a man on the outside. But on the inside, he was Jehovah God. I said, he was a man when he was weeping. But when he stood by the grave of a man had been dead for days. And the skin worms was crawling through his body. And he straightened his little figure up. The Bible said there was no beauty of him we should desire. But when he straightened up his little body and said, Lazarus! Come forth. And a man had been dead four days. Stood on his feet and lived again. That was more than a man. Amen. That was that mighty conqueror. Amen. That's who it was speaking out of him. I said, I'll go you a little better than that. He was a man when he come down off the mountain. Hungry. Looking around on a fig tree for something to eat. He was a man while he was hungry. But when he'd taken five little biscuits and two fish and fed 5,000, that was more than a man. Amen. Amen. That was God speaking through human lips. Amen. It's true. He was a man that night laying in the back of that little boat out on that stormy sea. The little boat was tossed about like a bottle stopper. And 10,000 devils of the sea had swore they'd drown him that night. He was tired. He was a man tired. He's laying in the back of the boat. But when once aroused, walked forward, put his foot on the rail of the boat, and looked up towards heaven and said, Peace, be still. And the winds and the waves obeyed him. Amen. That was more than a man speaking there. That was the great mighty conqueror. Amen. He spoke to the wind and it went to the cave like a puppy dog in the side of a lion. He spoke to the waves and they folded their hands in perfect rest upon the sea bosom. He was more than a man. He was a mighty conqueror. He could conquer nature. He conquered death. He conquered the waves. He conquered the air. There he is. There's never been one like him. Oh, I know you think I'm excited. Maybe I am. But let me alone. You may think I'm crazy. But I'm not happier this way than I was the other way, so I'd rather be this way. Oh, my. When I think of who he is, sure, he cried for mercy at the cross like a man. But on Easter morning, the Roman seal, the stone could not hold him. He broke the seals and rolled away the stone and come out. The mighty conqueror came out. He thrilled the heart of every poet, prophet, or every man that ever amounted to a hill of beans in this world has believed him that way. Oh, blind Fanny Crosby, if we could call her to the scene tonight, what do you think about him? She was a poet. She said, living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming, oh, glorious day. That was Eddie Pruitt instead of Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby said, pass me not, O oh, gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Amen. 
Thou the stream of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee, or whom in heaven but thee? Another one said, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming, oh glorious day. The mighty conqueror, he died as a witness to the earth, to a witness to the prophets. At 33 years old, he conquered the cross. He conquered the shame. He conquered every devil. And when he was dying, Jehovah God turned his face on him. And he died alone, forsaken by God and man. In the midst of all of that, he was more than a conqueror. Amen. 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 Oh, I feel pretty religious right now. He was more than a conqueror. In the face of every difficult death itself and forsaken of God, he walked to the front like a conqueror. Died in such a way till even the people who stood by had to witness that he was. The earth shook and took a nervous prostration. A chill ran over its back for shame. Its own creator had to drop his blood on the earth to redeem it. The moon and stars refused to shine. The Roman centurion said, truly, that was the Son of God. Pilate said, I wash my hands from him. Judas Iscariot said, I betrayed innocent blood. What was it? Everything had to recognize him. He'd been prophesied since the Garden of Eden, the woman's seed. All the prophets, everything gave notice and spoke forward to that time. When the greatest conqueror, when he would come and conquer everything that Adam lost in the fall, he would redeem it back to man. Oh, there was no king, monarch, potentate, or nothing to take that place. The mighty conqueror, Christ Jesus. When he died, the Bible said that he descended into hell and preached to the souls that were in prison. That repented not in the long suffering of the days of Noah. I can see him after he had bowed his head and the earth had shook. I can see him going descending down into the reaches of the lost. Knocks on the door. The door's open. In there, the tens of thousands and millions of young ladies that used to walk the street all fixed up and thought they were something. Young men who failed to listen to the message, stiff-necked church members who turned their back. He said, I am the one that Enoch said would come. God's word said so, and God has to keep his word. Amen. I am he that Enoch said would come, and you fail to hear my prophet. And they scream, no mercy, but there's no mercy. The door was closed on down to pass the demons that had already recognized it into the very doors of hell. The doors opened. There stood Satan. So oh, you finally arrived, did you? I thought I had you when I had Abel killed. I thought I had that seed that was promised. Satan's always look for that seed. He know that seed would be the conqueror. Amen. You're here in hell. But Jesus had went there because one preacher had prophesied under the Spirit and said, I'll not leave his soul in hell. He believed God's Word. Neither will I suffer my Holy One to see corruption. He knew within three days he'd come out of the grave. Seventy-two hours the human body corrupts. He know not one cell would corrupt because God's Word said so. See, I trusted the Word. Amen. And we call ourselves believers in Him and afraid to even rest our sickness with Him. Oh, my, afraid to talk to her boss about Him. Afraid to testify on the street, shamed of it. What do we do in the day of judgment? Look at Him. The devil said, now I've got you. I can see Him walk over to the devil, put His hands to His face, say, Satan, you've been a... In authority a long time. 
But I am the virgin born Son of God. My blood's still wet on the cross. I've come down to take over. I can see him reach on his side and jerk off those keys of death and hell and hang him on his own side. Satan, the big boost right back and slam the door in his face. He took over. He conquered hell. He's going out. Wait, there's somebody else that believed him. Way over yonder in paradise. There's a group of believers that couldn't enter into the presence of the Father because they went under the burnt offering. Sheep, goats, sprinkling of heifers, ashes. They could not go into the presence of the Father because animal blood would not atone for sin. It had to wait. It was just a substitute. That was a place called paradise. It's getting towards break of day. I can see him as he comes up to that door. Says that Abraham, go open the door, see who that is. Abraham walks out, opens the door. Said, come here, honey, look here. Look who's standing here. That's the same one that come and eat with us that day under the oak. About that time I can see Daniel say, what'd you say? Oh, he said, there he is. That's that stone that I saw hewed out of the mountains. Ezekiel said, what'd you say, Daniel? Oh, there he is. That's that wheel in the middle of the wheel, turning way up in the middle of the air. There he is. Job jumped up and said, what'd you say? He said, that's the one that I saw. I said, I know my Redeemer liveth, and at the last days he'll stand up on the earth. Though the skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I'll see God. There he is. That's him. I recognize him. The prophets and saints looked on and recognized him. Sure, they were waiting for him. Oh, he said, children, get ready. We're going out of here. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm so glad that my book is on, my, up in heaven. My name is on his register. I'm so glad that my sins are heard. The blood been signed, pardoned by his own precious blood. I'm so glad that I know him. And I'm sure that every Christian can say amen to that. Amen. I'm so glad that one of these mornings he'll come for us. And I can hear Abraham say, what'd you say, Lord? He said, it's almost daylight on earth. And you remember, on the third day, I'm the rise. Well, that's right. I hear Abraham say, listen, Lord, can we make a little whistle stop? Sarah and I have been wanting to look around the old land for a long time. Can we make just a little whistle stop? Said, yeah, I'm going to talk to my disciples for 40 days. You can have plenty of time. On Easter morning, when the sun was about ready to shine, the morning star come from the skies and rolled back the tomb. Stones in the Bible said that many of those the saints that slept in the dust of the earth rose and come into the city and appeared to many. I can see Caiaphas is walking around and saying, well, what do you think about that? Talking to his next priest. What do you think about that? Oh, all that rumor up there, the day getting black. What was it? Was that some magic trick or something or another? What do you think about it? I hear Sarah say, Abraham, who is that? And Caiaphas looked around and said, I ought to know that young man and woman somehow. Sarah, we're being noticed. And they had a body like his own glorious body. They vanished out of sight. They walked around for about 40 days. Then one day when he was standing under and began to see him, he was commissioning his disciples, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. These signs shall follow them that believe. While he was talking, there becomes daylight under his feet. Oh, gravitation had let loose. Oh, you talk about a conqueror. He conquered everything. And he begins to go up. Taken within the Old Testament saints, on beyond the moon, beyond the stars, beyond all the spheres that we could think of. After a while, they come into sight of the great, beautiful city. Oh, it is splendor. And the Old Testament saints being led by the Lord Jesus, the mighty conqueror. The Old Testament saints, when they got close to that great celestial city, they said, lift up ye everlasting gates and be ye lifted up. And let the King of Glory come in. 
And the angels behind the gate said, Who is this King of glory? And the Old Testament saints said, The Lord of hosts, mighty in battle, the, the great conqueror. They pressed the button and the pearly gate swung open wide. Down through the city of Jerusalem come Jesus in the forefront. All the Old Testament saints, he led captive, captive. He ascended on high, gave gifts to man, walked up in the presence of God the Father. And he said, here they are, Father. I have overcome and I brought him here. He said, climb up on this throne and sit down. Hallelujah. At my right hand, I make every enemy your footstool. He is a mighty conqueror. He rent the veil in two. There's never been a conqueror like him. He conquered death, hell, grave, fear, everything else, and it all lays in his blessed province tonight. It's for you and I. What we need today is something gallant. Men are looking for gallantry. Men are looking for somebody who can stand out in the front. Somebody who will be who they are. God grant the day to soon come. That when man will be what they claim to be. That man, if you're a sinner, say you're a sinner. Be honest about it and quit hiding behind the church. The coat of the church. I belong to so and so. Shame on you. If you wasn't a Christian, confess you're not a Christian. Man wants to see some gallant display of love. That great power that God has for you. That conquers. I used to be hunting in the North Woods years ago. Oh, how I love to hunt. My conversion never took it out of me. I just love to hunt. I used to go up in the North Woods to hunt up there with a fellow named Bert Call. One of the best walkers I ever walked. Good track man, fine hunter. But he was the cruel heartedest man that I ever met. Oh, he was wicked in his heart. And he used to shoot little fawns just to make me feel bad. Now the law requires if you want a fawn, get it. But not a dozen. I was game warden for years. I love wild animals. And I, I'm a conservationist. And Bert would just shoot him just to be mean. And he'd say, oh, you chicken-hearted preacher. He'd say, Billy, you'd make a, you're a good woodsman, but you're too chicken-hearted. I said, Bert, I want to be a, I want to be right in what I do. If it's hunting or it's dealing or whatever it is, I want to be a Christian. Oh, he said, you're just too chicken-hearted. One year I went up there, and he had invented some kind of a little old whistle. And he could put that in his mouth and go just exactly like a little baby deer crying. Like a little fawn. And he'd cry like that. I said, Bert, you're not going to use that, are you? He said, oh, go on, get next to yourself, Billy. I said, well, sure I'm going to use it. I thought, surely he won't do it. We hunted about a half a day, hadn't seen a track. We come to a little opening. Now, deers don't come in the opening in daytime when hunting season's in because they're afraid. And Bert stooped down. There's a little snow there about needy. No, maybe in the drift. And so he stooped down. I wondered what he was going to do. And he went out in his pocket and he got this little whistle. I thought, oh, surely he's not. Surely he's not going to do that. And he blowed this whistle and sounded like a little baby fawn. Well, just about... Forty or fifty yards from there, a great, big, beautiful doe, that's the mother deer, stood up. Oh, her great, graceful look she had, big veins in her face, her big, pretty brown eyes, those great, big ears. She began looking around. She heard a baby's cry. She wouldn't have done that now if it had, she hadn't been a mother. But see, the mother instinct in her made her call, answer that baby's call, rather. And I thought, oh... And he looked at me kind of sheepish, grin. I turned my head, I thought, oh, I can't see him do it. And I looked, and the deer was watching. What happened? She's listening for that baby. She was a mother. See, by nature she was a mother. Fear had no hope then. Love cast away fear. Oh, if we could be the Christian, that deer was a mother. She made some steps. I thought, oh, my Bert lowered his rifle, stooped his head. I just stood still by a bush. I thought, oh my, you can't do that. She walked right out in that open. She couldn't help it. Do you hear me? She couldn't help it. She was a mother. That baby was in trouble. It was her nature. She wasn't a hypocrite. 
She wasn't putting that on. It was her nature. She was a mother by nature. And we've got to be a Christian by the same way. Not a put on, not a make belief, but something within you. She walks out there in the open, and I heard the boat click in that 30 odd six. I seen that steady arm move down, that scope hair across her heart. I thought, oh my, how can you do it, Bert? Why are you so evil? I, I turned my head, I watched that arm before it did. He's holding that sight level. I knew just in a moment he'd blow her heart plumb out of her. That real true mother looking for that baby, he'd blow her heart plumb out the other side of her shoulders. I thought, oh, I couldn't do that, Bert. I said, oh, God, help. And I was listening to hear the hammer fall and any time the gun go off to spoil that beautiful display of real genuine love. And it was strange. I waited a moment. The gun never fired. I waited a little longer. Still the gun never fired. And I turned to look. And the rifle was going like this. He couldn't hold it steady. He threw the rifle on the ground and great big tears running down his cheeks. He grabbed me by the hand and said, Billy, pray for me. I've had enough of it. He said, I can't stand it any longer. What was it? The real, genuine display of real mother love and a hero conquered that bitter-hearted sinner. Brother, this world's looking for a real hero that'll stand out and out for Christ. It'll conquer more sinners than all of our flowerly sermons or denominations ever could do it. Don't you want to be as much Christian as that doe was a mother? If you're not that tonight, while we bow our heads for a moment, think of the mighty conqueror who's made the way for you, broke down every shackle, done everything that he could, conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave, and begging to you tonight to come and receive him. While we have our heads down in the organist will give us just a little tune, I want to ask you a question. If you're here without Christ tonight, if you haven't got a real genuine experience, I want to ask you, there's too many church members today. There's too many people trying to pretend to be Christians. If you're not really deeply in love in your heart with Christ, there's no Christ there. Could you take a stand for Christ like that Mother Doe did for her baby? Is that kind of a love in your heart that you'd walk right in the face of death? Well, you can hardly testify. Do you really want Christ in your heart like that? As God's prophet, I say to you tonight, Christ is in this building to receive you. And He's knocking at your heart's door. Won't you just receive Him just now? Now, while we're all in prayer, every Christian, is there... How many is in here tonight that would raise up your hands to God, not to me, and by that say, God, make me in my heart. I accept Christ the conqueror. I'm a sinner. I'm a pretender of Christianity. I'm just a church member. I need Christ. I can't conquer myself. I tried to quit smoking. I couldn't do it. I tried to quit lying. I couldn't do it. I tried to quit playing the part of a hypocrite. I couldn't do it. But I go to church. My mother went to church. She taught me I should go. But as yet, I've never come to that place. Certainly you can He's the conqueror, the mighty conqueror. Will you accept his pardoning tonight? If you will, in the face of this audience, the face of Almighty God, Christ, the holy angels, will you raise your hand to him saying, God, be merciful to me. I need you just now. Fill my heart with that kind of a love that I'll never... God bless you, my brother. God bless you, sister. Bless you, my brother. Bless you, sister. You, sister. You over there, brother. On the main floor now. You, brother, over here. Someone else, raise your hand and say, God, be merciful to me just now. God bless you, young fellow sitting here. Someone else, God bless you, lady sitting here. Be honest. God bless you, lady. That's good. The balcony to my right. Would you raise your hand saying, God, be merciful to me. Give unto me that experience that I really need. Give me that love. I've tried to quit going to picture shows. I've, I've heard people say worldly pleasures. 
Well, the Bible said, if you love the world or the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you. Oh, but Brother Bram, I go to church. I love the Lord, but I... Well, wait a minute. God bless you, brother. I, God bless you there, brother. I love the Lord, but I... Oh, no. The Bible said that you do not love the Lord if you love the things of the world. Will you raise your hand and say, God, take the world out of me then? I'll be honest. I confess that I'm a lover of the world. I stay home from prayer meetings. I love to hear Arthur Godfrey. I love to hear Elvis Presley. I love to see who loves Susie or lo all that kind of stuff. I've got a custom. You're accustomed to the world. I don't want to get adjusted to this world. I want to go out of this world someday in peace with God. And I must have that kind of love to carry me through. I can't create it in myself, but one has conquered sin. He's conquered the worldly desires. And he's a mighty conqueror tonight. And I accept him as my propitiation for my sins. And I now hold my hands to God, saying, God, make me what I ought to be. God bless you here, lady. And God bless you up there. And God bless you, sir. Up in the balcony, sure, to the right again. You mean there's no one up there that doesn't want Christ? You mean you're living that perfect life with Christ? God be your judge. If he knocks at your heart and you turn it away, you're a worse sinner than he was when he come in. The balcony is to the rear. Would you raise your hand? Be honest. Be honest with God. The balcony is to my left. Would you raise your hand? God bless you, sir. That's a real manly act. God bless you over here, young fella. God be with you. Someone else. Remember me. God bless you, sir, right here. The Lord be with you. God bless you, little fellow back there. God bless you, lady sitting there. God bless you, sir, sitting here. God bless you back there, my brother. That's good. Be honest. What will it do? God bless you back there, sir. God saw your hands. God bless you, young man. What do you do when you put up your hands? It shows that there's a supernatural being on the inside of you has made a choice. And you've raised your hand. That defies every law of gravitation. Your hand should hang down. But when something inside of you, a spirit, that's got to live forever somewhere, God bless you, sir. And that spirit has made a decision. God bless you, young lady. God bless you, young man. Yes, I just like to recognize them when they put their hands up. God's looking, of course he does. If I miss it, he sees it. Put up their hands and say, remember me in prayer, brother. I want to accept Christ. I want to be a real Christian. I always said if I ever was a Christian, I'd really be one. Now's the time to fulfill that will. You want to be a real Christian? Born again? Just raise your hands and say, God, be merciful to me. What does it do? The decision in your heart. Their spirit has made a decision. And your body, your physical being, which gravitation holds down your hand, your spirit raises it up to your Creator. I now accept Christ as my Savior. You couldn't do that if you had to, unless God knocked. No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. And all that comes, I will in no wise cast out. I'll give him everlasting life, raise him up at the last days. Would there be another before we pray? I just want to offer prayer tonight for you, right where you are. Now I wonder, you that's asked for prayer, you that believe, would you stand to your feet just a moment? Let us pray. Just stand right up all over the building. Everyone raise your hands. Most to be remembered in this prayer. God bless you. That's right. God bless you. Balconies and all, stand to your feet. That's right. Stand to your feet everywhere. Everybody raise your hand. Just stand up. You're a witness now. Isn't that wonderful? What's happened? That's the greatest miracle it ever performed. When God comes to the heart and speaks... Now, I'm sure of this, that these others here should be standing. Now, while you remain standing, you that are, God said, my spirit will not always strive with man. Oh, as an evangelist around the world, 25 years on the field, how many heartbroken stories could I tell you of people who's failed to do it? And meet me later on, them dead, sometimes before you can even get to them, screaming and crying for mercy. Go out to meet God without hope, without anything. Because they fail. My spirit will not always strive. Come to your feet there, sinner. You backslider. You that's impersonating a Christian. You that hasn't got that real something in your heart. No matter how good you are before your pastor, your name might be real bright at your church, but what is it in glory? 
You might have a good standing here on earth, but what is it in heaven? If it's not real and God hasn't witnessed it by genuine love that would drive you beyond what that mother dear did, then you better stand and accept Christ. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived by joining a church. There's no church on the earth has power to save you. It's your own personal faith in Christ. And if your life doesn't compare with that faith that you profess to have, then he hasn't accepted you. Will you stand now just before prayer? I'm offering to you Christ. If I shall never see you again on this earth, remember in your dying hour, this message will echo back and forth on your deathbed. You remember that. It, you may be laying out here on the road bleeding to death, but you'll scream, oh, if I could only hear that preacher once more, if I could only get to that altar, if I could only raise to my feet. It's too late then. God said in your calamities, I'll only laugh at you. You better come now while you got a chance. Just stand to your feet. If he's done so much for you, come from heaven, the great conqueror, and done what he did, how can you sit there and not raise up and accept him as your Savior? How can you do it? The reason I'm continuing talking, people's continually standing. Certainly, stand to your feet. Be what you are. You know in your heart, you say, well, here my neighbor sits by me. My pastor's sitting back there. But remember, your Savior's here too. If he's speaking to your heart, get to your feet right quick now while we have prayer. Young or old, that'll make any difference. Death's no respected person. It comes to all. Is this it? Is this the crop of the night? If it is, you who are standing on your feet, bow your head just a moment. As a messenger from Christ, as his ambassador, I say this that you could not have stood by yourself. God spoke to your heart. And he that will confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father and the holy angels. And as you stand with bowed heads, you're already saved. When you raise to your feet, God put your name on the book of life. If you really meant that from your heart, there's not enough demons in hell to ever separate you from the love of God that's in Christ. I'm going to quote to you Jesus Christ's own words. He that heareth my words, that's what I've been preaching. And believeth on him that sent me has passed from death unto life and shall never come to the judgment, but has eternal life. That's what you have. That's God's word. As a preacher, that's all I can tell you. That's all God says. And while you're standing there, I'm going to offer prayer. You pray to in your heart. Say, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Oh, Lord, I'll be a true servant as long as I live. Those in the balconies, those on the main floors, let us pray. Blessed Jesus, as a result of the gathering tonight, these many souls has come to the kingdom. You spoke to their hearts. They were honest. They seen that they were lost. They seen they could not no more save their self than a leopard could lick the spots off of him. They were totally helpless. But somehow, that great, glorious, mighty conqueror came down and said, Child of mine, why are you so weary? I have overcome the world. I have the keys of death and hell. I'll raise you up at the last day if you'll only believe on me. And they stood to their feet in a call and a decision has been made in their heart that from this hour, they've turned their affections to you, Lord. And I give them to you as gifts of the ministry and of the gifts of this message and the gifts of the Holy Spirit that has wooed them to thee tonight. Thou hast promised in thy word that you to no wise cast them out, but that you would give them eternal life and raise them up at the last day. Now, Father, they are yours. Keep them by thy Holy Spirit until that day when it's all finished, and then together shall we live through all eternal ages. We thank Thee for them. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now, as you repented sinners, sit down. Let somebody next to you shake hands with them all around everywhere. While we sing, blessed be the tie that binds. Blessed be a tie that binds my heart in Christ. If there's a minister here, See some of them people out of your neighborhood? Go to him now. Shake his hand and invite him over to your church. If he hasn't been baptized, take him down and baptize him. Baptize them. That's what you want to do.
That's right. That's right. Walk over and shake hands. I seen a man here walk over and shake hands with Brother Dawson. An old pastor, a man just got saved, walked over and shook that minister's hand. Bless me. this wonderful? I tell you, Christians, I love this old-fashioned scouring out gospel. You'll never see the day that anything will ever take its place. Oh, I just love him. Let's sing this. Good. How many likes old-fashioned songs? Do you like them? That's good. Organist, you do a wonderful job, brother. I appreciate you so much. I wonder if you know this song, Peace, Peace, Wonderful Peace. Coming down from the Father above. How many knows that? All right, let's all sing it together now if we get it. All right. Peace. Peace. Let's just raise up our hands to worship God. All peace. Coming down from the Father. Sing it quietly like this. Peace. Peace. Just worship now. Wonderful peace. Coming down from the far above. Just bathe in his beauty. The message is over. Let's worship. The fun. Just open up that callous heart now. Let him come down. Just settle over you like dewdrops. After my wife had gone home, I used to wonder why did he take her? Why did he leave me and Billy? Of an evening after work, I used to go out to the graveyard. I'd sit down out there by the side of the grave against a little old tree. I looked down at the grave and I thought, why did you go there? I'd get real melancholy. It used to be an old dove come set in the bush. She'd start cooing sweetly. I used to hum that song to that dove. And just something that's sweet for me. I'd sit there and sing, peace, peace, Wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweet over our spirit.
Spirit forever. I pray in the fabulous billows of love. Don't you want him to meet you there that day? When I come to the river at the ending of days, and it seems like my friends have all gone, there's one thought that cheers me and makes my heart glad. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. That's one thing I know. I remember when she was going, I said, Are you going home? She said, Yes, Billy. Honey? She said, you've talked about it, but you don't know what it is. She said, oh, it's wonderful. I've seen those big dark eyes look up. She said, preach, Billy, this message. I said, I will, dear. I said, are you really going? She said, oh, it's so wonderful. She said, don't let my children be drug about from pillar to post. Marry some good Christian girl that'll take care of them. I said, hope, by God's grace... On that morning, you stand right over there by the side of the eastern gate. And when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and them coming in, go to screaming Bill just as loud as you can. I'll have the children together. I'll meet you there. She said, I'll be waiting for you. Well, that's been 18 years ago. I'm still on the battlefront tonight. Not a bit weary. I'm waiting. Some glorious day, I'll go. I'll preach my last sermon. I'll make my last altar call. I'll pray for the last sick person. Then I shall go to him who loved me when I was unlovable, who gave to me something that the world could not give, who gave me a satisfaction that somehow no wooing of the world has ever been able to allure me from this blessed place. I'm so happy tonight that I'm on my way with you, you Christians. Someday we'll meet there by God's grace. Father, be with us now. We've preached your word. Sinners has repented. We've worshipped thee. We love you. Now there's sickness among us, Lord. Let this audience see that you're Christ. Let them see that you haven't forsaken. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Heal them, Father, tonight. For you was wounded for our transgressions. With your stripes we were healed. May we be able to accept it. Come tonight and do something just like you did before you was crucified. Before you conquered death itself and then rose up again. When you got those from Emmaus or going to Emmaus and went into the little restaurant, shut the door behind you, got over in the little corner to yourself, you'd done something that no one else could ever do it. And they knew you'd raised from the dead. Quickly you vanished out of their sights. They wondered why the meeting ended so quick. But they run quickly back, not to argue their religious views, but they knew that they had met Jesus. May that be the same thing that we leave here tonight. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Your female trouble has left you. And besides that, that girl that you're praying for, your daughter with the heart trouble, if you believe she'll get well too. And you've got adopted son. That's a wayward boy, and you're praying for him to be saved. Isn't that right? Then you shall have that also. God bless you. See the grace of God? You just act gallant once to God one time and watch what God does for you. He wants you to take his word. Don't doubt him. Just believe him with all your heart. Number 11 hasn't come up yet. Look around. That might be somebody who can't hear. Number 11. Well, we'll start praying for the sick. If 11 comes in, just tell them to come on to the platform. They might be just stepped out somewhere and coming back. All right. All right. Uh, you, sir? All right. All right. That's, all. That's fine. Now, we got how many in the line? Now... We'll see how it begins to move then. Everybody, be, we only need three for a witness. Is that right? How many believe we need three for a witness? 
you'll be one witness. And I believe there's several things that you were asking for. If this audience, somebody out here believes God, look to him and live. For a witness. Here it is. The lady at the wheelchair. It, no, it's a man just behind her. Uh, look like it. The man is suffering with a chest trouble. You believe, sir, that God will make you well? You do? What do you think about sister sitting next to him? You believe that God would heal you the back trouble too and make you well? You accept it and believe it? If you do, yes. All right, raise your hands if you do. Both of you sitting there. There you are. There's three what a witness we need. Jesus Christ lives, doesn't he? Amen. You couldn't hide your life now if you had to. The Holy Spirit is here. The living Christ. You sinners a while ago that accepted you were sinners. You're children beloved now. You were a while ago. You, you might could have doubted. Now you're saved. Here's your living Christ, right? You're a spirit in our midst here that's doing these things that you see done. Doesn't it thrill your heart? Doesn't it do something for you? Now, to the rest of you, you just look and live. Believe with all your heart and all that is within you. And God shall grant unto you the wonderful things that you want. How do you do? Now, the lady, as far as I know, all in the prayer line, are we strangers to each other? Raise your hands. The ones in the prayer line, if we don't know each other. I don't know you. It, raise your hands. Sir. All in the audience is strangers. Raise your hands. Now, you just look this way and believe now for the next few minutes. If I am the truth, the Bible said that there be one spiritual or prophet among you. If he declares something and it doesn't come to pass, don't you listen to him because he's false. But if it does come to pass, know what I've spoke through him. Is that right? Amen. I say that Jesus Christ is alive right here now. His spirit is right here in this building. And he's doing these things that's being done. He's doing the same things that he did when he looked over his audience, perceived their thoughts, and what was in their hearts. It's the same Christ. Amen. We being strangers to each other, never meeting each other before, if the Holy Spirit will perform something here now, before this audience, the same that he did when he was, let's see, a man and a woman would be like it was in St. John 4, to the Samaritan woman and the Lord when they were talking. Nothing to be excited. The anointing comes to you and then goes away. Now, don't be scared. Nothing here to hurt you. If there's anything, it's something that will help you. If God will let me know where your trouble is, you'll accept Christ as your pardon. Is that right? The first thing, you don't realize how close you are to death's door because you have heart trouble. That's right. And you have trouble with your stomach. That's right. And you have trouble with your liver. So your doctor says, that's right. Are those things true? Yes, that's right. It's your heart because it's the nerves that's doing the, everything. Mm -hmm. There's your trouble. You're not from the city here. You're from out of town. Mrs. DeBoard, if you will believe with all your heart, you can go home and be well. You believe that now with all your heart? If you do, if you just raise your hand and say, I now accept Christ as my personal healer. You'll do it? Father, I pray for the woman that you will encourage and increase her faith. And give her deliverance in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you now. Go believe it. How do you do? Suppose we're strangers to each other also. We have never met before in life. But this is our first meeting time. Man and woman again. But I perceive that you do have faith. Right? What a different vibration there was to the person that just left. I mean, but that's a way. It's a contact with spirit life. The world knows nothing of it. If God will declare to me what your trouble is, will you accept Christ as being present 
your healer. Your conscience lady, as a believer, as soon as you walked up there, he was contacted right then. If that's right, raise your hand. You felt that something just swept over you, a real sweet feeling. See, I had to coax with the other patient. It's not so there. It's right there. See, that's the difference in faith. You have heart trouble, and you're extremely nervous. And your nervousness is what's making your heart trouble. It's a nervous heart. You have all kinds of funny thoughts go through your mind. That's right. From that's nervous. You get real nervous in the late of the evening, especially before sundown. You get kind of funny feelings, lonesome, melancholy feelings. I see you drop something. It must be a dish or something. You're coming from a place where you're doing something, something you was working with. You're not from this country. You come from the south, coming this way. You're across the border. You're American. You're from Montana. Bernice? Porter? That's who you are. Go home, you're well. Glory. Jesus Christ Thank makes you well. Hallelujah. 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 Suppose that we are strangers to each other too. I've never met you in this life. But Jesus Christ, God's Son, is present. I'm tired, I'm weak. But when you're weak, then you're strong. Don't move, please don't. See? Spirit contacts, and when you move, that interrupts. You just sit real still a few minutes. Sure, if you listen to the message, you can listen to Christ a minute. I see a great long distance begin to form. And it's going eastward. You're not here for yourself. You are here for a younger person. That's your daughter. And she's in a hospital with a nervous condition. And that's a way away in a big pine country, Ontario. And she's unsaved, and you're worrying about her soul. Yes. And she's a nervous breaking in the hospital, and that's what it is. God's dealing with her heart. Thus the saith the Lord. <laughs> now the handkerchief, if you got in your hand. That's right here. Now I just want you to wipe the tears off your eyes and send it to her in Jesus' name for her. Amen. You believe, my sister. You believe that Jesus Christ be the Son of God, and that's His presence. You're at your all the preaching, and well, it's just an open, wide open confession that He's here. I've never seen you in my life. God knows all about you. You're extremely nervous. And you're suffering with a growth. And that growth is a garter inside the throat. A nervous garter. It's what has done it. You're not from this country. You're from a different country. You're from a place called Westminster, British Columbia. You're Mrs. Shoemaker. <laughs> and your first name is Margaret. Amen. That's thus saith the Lord. Amen. Return home and be healed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is present? How many Bible readers knows that that's just exactly the way he did it when he was here on earth? Be reverent just a moment. Now we don't need... Now here's the real service. Here's where you should believe. That's what takes the life from you. Now you say, Brother Bram, you mean to tell me, look at the back of my hands. It feels like just every muscle in me is give away. Oh, you say, Brother Branham, if you're a Bible reader, you'll understand. Do you understand? You believe God will heal you with your heart trouble, make you well, go home, feel it, God will make you heal. Do you believe it? Let me lay hands on you. Look, sir. There's something here that knows you. Not me, him. 
Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Did he say that? You believe it? Then in Christ's name be made well. Amen. Oh, believe me. The shadow of death. Cancer. Did Jesus say, These signs shall follow them that believe? You believe it, he'll take that out of you and make you well? Give me your hand just a moment. With this great church of God, I pray in Jesus' Jesus. name, God, for you to spare the life of this sainted woman. Let her live. This prayer I offer in Jesus' name, in her behalf. Amen. God bless you, sister. Go believe in you. One day coming up Golgotha, there was an old rugged cross dragging out the bloody footprints of the barrier. His little frail body was so weak, he couldn't go no farther. And he fell under the load of the cross. There was a fellow by the name of Simon the Serene who came up and picked the cross up, put it on his shoulder. And on that shoulder of that cross on Simon was the blood of the Lord Jesus. That was your ancient father. And here's one of his daughters here tonight with diabetes, sugar in that blood. You believe that he'll take it away? God be merciful, I'm sure you understand, Lord. I ask this with all my heart, in Jesus' name, for her healing. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Amen. Glory, hallelujah. Kidney trouble's a bad thing. But you believe Jesus will make you well? Blessed God. Heal this, my sister, of this trouble. May she go tonight and be made well through Christ's name for the glory of God. Amen. When you got up down there, of course, we know you, your eyes are bad. That's been all your life. But you've got heart trouble, too. And it's not so much you're willing to put up with your eyes, but it's your heart's what you're worried about. If that's right, raise up your hand. All right. Lord Jesus, bless him. Doctors could make him glasses to wear, but they can't make him a heart. God, you do this for him, will you, Lord? Dwell therein in great power. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, my good man. Go and may God be with you and help you. Arthritis would cripple you and make you a cripple all your life. You was trying to make a decision sitting there a while ago. Finally, you thought she should come through the line because you wanted me to lay hands on you. Come up here just a minute. Lord God, heal our brother and take this power of enemy away from him. I pray in Christ's name and may this Bible, this word that he holds in his hand, may it be a blessing to his heart to strengthen him to know that the prayer of faith has been prayed over him. The Bible said it shall save the sick. Amen. Bless you, my dear brother. Come. Insulin is a great thing. It'll help. But let you and I go to Calvary tonight for a blood transfusion for this diabetes. So you really get well. Will you do it with me? Dear God, bless this man and take from him this prostrate trouble, this nervous condition. Take this diabetes from him. And now by faith we bring him in the presence of Calvary and ask for his healing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, my brother. You believe God will cure that back for you and make you well? You believe he'll do it? Just walk off the platform saying, Blessed be the name of the Lord God, and he'll make it. Father, in Jesus Christ's name, I pray that you will heal our sister and make her completely whole. For your glory, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You had the same thing, so just keep walking off the platform and praising God. Amen. What about the audience? Are you ready to believe? Now, somewhere out in the audience there, Look this away. Just believe. Some of you is sick. Raise your hands. Say, just in your heart, Jesus, I love you. Just raise your hands. Something to find favor with him. Somewhere. Here it is. A little woman wiping her mouth there. Heart trouble and bladder trouble. You believe God will heal your sister and make you well? Little Rose, you believe it with all your heart? You believe God will make you well? Raise your hand to him like this. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I go home and be well. Amen. What about it? 
What do you think, sitting here, sir? Sinus trouble. Do you believe God will make you well sitting back there? You believe it? With all your heart? You can have it too. All right, sir. Amen. What about the lady there? Just behind, got trouble with the ears. You believe God would heal you with the ear trouble? All right. Go home. Be made well. Christ's name. Amen. What about the next lady sitting right there that's got growths in her nose? The great lady with the green hat on. Yes. You believe God will make you well, lady? If you believe it with all your heart, you can have it. Amen. What about the lady next to her suffering with a nervous trouble? You believe God will make you well, lady? If you do, raise your hand. Amen. What does this audience think about him? Do you believe that he's present? You believe the mighty conqueror has did it for you? Blessed Lord, hear the prayer of your servants. Lay your hands over on each other. I'll do all that is within me, my friend, to pray the prayer of faith for each of you. Pray now. God, I thank Thee that Thou has made a way and has showed Your power here tonight. I'm very tired, Lord. You know my conditions. I pray just now that in Jesus' name that You'll sweep over this building. Oh, God, may the people... What more can You do, Lord? You've brought sinners to the altar. You've revealed the secrets of the heart. You've proclaimed healing over them. You've done great things. Oh, God, I pray that you'll bless these handkerchiefs. Somewhere across the country, an old blind daddy's awaiting. A little baby laying on the bed sick waiting. Oh, we're taught one day that the Red Sea had Israel cornered off from the promised land. And one writer said that God looked down through that pillar of fire with angry eyes. And when the Red Sea saw him looking through that pillar of fire, he got scared. And the sea walled up. He was scared of those angry eyes of God because they were shutting off his coveted people from their promise. And they passed over dry shod and went to the promised land. Oh, God. We know in the Bible that we're taught that St. Paul took from his body handkerchiefs or aprons. And there was laid on the sick and the afflicted. Evil spirits went out of them. Sickness was healed. Lord, we know we're not St. Paul, but we know you're still the same Jesus. And God, we pray that as these handkerchiefs lays upon the bodies of the sick, may Christ look through the, his own shed blood and the faith that these people has, and may the devil get scared and leave the people. And may they pass to the good land of health and strength as God has promised them. Bless these who are present here, these who are sick, afflicted, these with their hands on each other. I ask in their behalf, as standing between the living and dead, that I challenge the devil. You are nothing but a bluff, Satan. You've bluffed the people, but Jesus Christ had the keys to the kingdom of heaven and given to the church. He took the keys of death and hell away from you. He's the mighty conqueror and you're stripped of everything that you ever possessed and you're nothing but a bluff and we're calling your hand in the faith and the as a vicarious son of God who died and rose again the third day and is present right now doing the same miracles that he did when he was here on earth. Satan, I charge thee through Jesus Christ and his blood to come out of this audience and leave every person in Jesus Christ's name.